Hello, everybody, and welcome to our Extranet User Manager v4 release webinar. Peter Carson here. I'm going to be your host for uh, next hour, maybe a little bit less, actually. We'll, we'll see how the timing goes, actually, being a brand new release webinar. haven't delivered this one before. So why don't we start with some quick introductions for those of you that are new to, uh, to working with us. As I mentioned, my name is Peter Carson. I'm the president of Envision IT and Extranet User Manager. I'm also a SharePoint MVP and a partner seller with Microsoft Canada. We're going to put a copy of the deck up on our site afterwards. We'll send a follow-up email as well. So all my contact information will be up in there. Also on the line, we've got Logan Guest. Logan runs sales here at Extranet User Manager, so he's your prime point of contact if you'd like to follow up about uh, putting together a trial, having a deeper look at UMV4, or scheduling a call with us. Uh, he'd be happy to arrange that for you. So what I thought I'd start with is just a, a brief history of Extranet User Manager. How has it evolved over the years? What sort of changes have happened that have brought us to where we are here today? It actually goes back close to 10 years now. We we built a number of custom Extranet solutions for clients, primarily around SharePoint, uh, probably about five or six different clients over a couple of years time period. And, and what we realized was the Extranet scenario was underserved in the SharePoint space. And we had a great solution for that, but it was very bespoke and unique for each of our clients. So around five, six years ago, uh, we started to productize the, the code base and say, okay, well, let's build this as a repeatable, installable um, software product that we can more easily support because we don't have all these different code bases with different clients. We did that. We launched that out still under the Envision IT banner. Um, a couple of years after that, 2014, we added Office 365 support. And then two years ago, we decided, you know what, let's actually launch this out as its own brand. So we built the Extranet User Manager brand and website, launched that out. Um, great success from that point of view. Since then, we've added Azure B2B support in 2016. And then earlier this year, we launched out our channel partner program. So as of today, now we've got more than 75 customers deployed with Extranet User Manager around the world. Uh, majority of them in North America, but between Canada and the US, um, quite a few in, in Europe, some in Asia, some in Australia, um, across a wide spectrum of different industries. So that's sort of a, a brief history of Extranet User Manager. In terms of where we go from here, uh, quick agenda for what we want to cover through the webinar. And we've already done the introductions. I'm going to do just a, a single quick poll. I want to get a sense of uh, SharePoint experience within the attendees. Now, we've done the history of, of the UM before, but we're going to go into, or sorry, the history of Extranet User Manager. We're going to go into the history of version 4, which we're announcing today. We'll, we'll dive deeper into some of those features. I should go into some demos, both with our own product and with one of our clients. Um, touch on licensing and and take it from there. So as I mentioned, I want to do a, uh, a quick poll to begin with, just around versions of SharePoint that uh, you're currently using here today. So let me just launch that out. You can answer more than one of these. I'm just curious who's in Office 65 in the cloud, who's using on-premise SharePoint. I just realized we should have added SharePoint Server 2016. We do support it. Um, we'll have to update the slide deck for that. Actually, the uh, the poll has that, so that's good. And I'll just give you a, a minute more to respond to that, and then I'll share those results back with everybody. All right. So we've got almost everybody in there. I'll give you about 10, 15 seconds, the last few to, uh, to vote through for that. All right, so let's share that back just so everybody can see the results from there. Um, about a third on Office 365. That number's been climbing um, steadily, particularly here in Canada with the Canadian data centers that opened a while back. Um, about a quarter already on SharePoint Server 2016. We've done a couple of upgrade projects to, uh, to 2016. We've actually upgraded our own websites to that as well. And then about um, half and then a little less than half between 2013 and 2010. So, you know, the numbers obviously add up to more than 100%. So obviously folks are, are using multiple different environments, hybrid in there, you know, there may be a mix of 365 and on-premises. Um, interesting to see how that breaks down from there. All right. So let's come back to our slide deck here. 
And let's do the big reveal on introducing EUMV4. Unfortunately, I'm not Tim Cook. I don't have a, a fancy new auditorium uh, to announce the, the product announcements in, but we're still very excited about that. We do have a, a, a new office we're very proud of here in Mississauga, Ontario, in Canada, where we're located. Uh, but let's come back to, you know, again, a bit of a history. You know, why did we decide to build a new EUM? What was driving this? Well, if we look back at um, External User Manager version 2 and version 3, both of which we still support, V2, was the original forms based authentication implementation. V3 introduced the federation model that we needed for Office 365, but it also simplified things significantly for um, on-premises SharePoint as well in terms of how we installed the product. But the ASP.NET Web Forms technology it's built on is really outdated. I mean, it even goes back further than 2012 from that point of view, and it was showing its, its age. It was time to update that. Now, also, um, you know, we had implemented what are called REST APIs, um, programming interfaces that allow you to automate certain features of Extranet User Manager, but that was only a partial implementation. We'd done it based on customer demand. As they wanted a particular feature, we would build the API for that, and, and it kind of evolved and grew from that. Some of those ended up in the core product. Some of those ended up in bespoke um, unique solutions for particular client implementations. And we decided, you know what, we really need to re-architect and, and build a complete REST API for the entire product, not just for the end user components, but for the administration components as well. Um, I realized I didn't put it in the slide here. Uh, part of what was driving that is is just around the scalability of the application as well. I mean, most of our clients are in the, the hundreds or thousands of external users. Uh, we've got some, though, into the tens of thousands or even into the hundreds of thousands. And we start to see um, some challenges there in terms of scalability. It wasn't built to, to scale from a UX point of view to that level. And, and that's something we wanted to address here is to make sure that we can support well into the hundreds of thousands of external users, have that function and respond quickly. And, and work well from a user experience point of view. So the approach of using client-side HTML and REST APIs, I mean, those are the modern development trend. Uh, they work very well in terms of decoupling uh, the presentation and the back end code. They also make it a lot easier to upgrade, and, and we'll talk more about why that and, and what that looks like. Um, also introduces you know, a much broader um, pool of, of developers. You know, if you understand web stack, HTML, JavaScript, jQuery kind of development, which is a very common modern approach, then you know how to develop with Extranet User Manager. There's no special skills involved. Uh, makes it much easier for, for those development projects to happen. Uh, the, the minor version upgrades, those were difficult to deploy because the, the previous version, any of the customizations were actually compiled and baked in and tied to that particular version of UM. So even if we had a bug fix or a, a feature update that we wanted to deploy to a client, you know, they typically had to, to recompile their, their customizations and that whole upgrade process became very difficult. So that was a barrier to upgrade, which we didn't want to see. We want people to be able to, to run the most current version of our software, uh, both from a security point of view and from a feature set point of view. That's important to us. And then lastly, WS Federation. Uh, this is how we introduced the, the Federation model to support Office 65 back in 2014. Uh, WS Fed is a is an industry-wide um, protocol, and, and it's been around for pushing 20 years. It was kind of the early 2000s that it first came out. You know, Microsoft's behind it. Uh, they're probably the biggest proponent. It's, it's supported by quite a number of other vendors as well. But it really isn't a, a modern mechanism for doing single sign-on, and there was better ways to do that. And that's part of what we've achieved as part of EUM v4. So let's go into the highlights. What's what's new and interesting in version four of Extranet User Manager? Well, as I mentioned previously, uh, we'd done a patchwork approach to implementing REST APIs. We said, you know what? We're going to go through the entire application, all the functionality, and we're going to completely expose that as a REST API. And I'll show you what some of those pages look like, um, how that API is structured. So all the front end pages, everything that you see as a user, whether you're an administrator, a business owner, a group owner, or an external user, um, are all built as HTML pages with jQuery, so they're very easy to customize. Now, single sign-on, we've done a, a major upgrade there. Under the hood, we use what's called Identity Server. It's an open source um, identity provider that that's, was version 2 in our Extranet User Manager 3. Uh, that supported the WS Federation. We've jumped to version. We've gone to Identity Server 4, which is their most current version, in order to provide the OpenID Connect support. OpenID Connect, I'll talk more about, is a modern authentication and authorization standard uh, that's that's broadly supported. You know, Google, Facebook. Facebook, Microsoft, they're all behind it. Um, they're all very supportive of it. So it's it's much more modern and, and easier standard to use from that point of view.
All the, the UI pages, as well as being HTML and jQuery, they're built with Bootstrap um, that provides easy mobile support. So whether you're on a smartphone, a tablet, a desktop device, you're gonna get a great user experience across all of that. And again, the, the development is gonna be very simplified from that perspective. So any branding or customization work that you're gonna do um, is that much easier to do. And, and even taking it further from a branding point of view, you don't necessarily need to brand Extranet User Manager itself. You can actually take the, the, the forms themselves and embed them right into your portal applications, whether that's SharePoint or Custom App, um, you can put that right in. And we'll show you some client examples where we've done that. So what this does is it makes it much easier for us to upgrade the underlying EUM version without rebuilding all those customizations. As long as we adhere to uh, to the REST design philosophy that we don't change the structure of those APIs, we can change what they do under the hood. We can add enhancements, fixes, and things like that. It doesn't break any of those customizations that then call into those API endpoints. So what's the history? How long have you been working on this? You know, how did it come to be and, and what led us to here today? Well, you know, it's been on the product backlog for some time. We wanted to do a, a redesign of the UI. It needed refreshing. We wanted to do the REST API implementation. Uh, but, you know, like anything else, there's always challenges around prioritizing the product backlog and client demands and such. Um, so we hadn't had a chance to really dive into that. And then last fall, so fall of 2016, we started working on a new site for Ontario MD. We did a webinar um, earlier in the summer on this, and, and really this was to build a new public-facing website and extranet for www.ontariomd.ca. We launched that out in the this, uh, May of 2017, but as we were getting going on the design work for that, we, we came to an understanding that the registration and the user management requirements that they had were actually really complex. You know, the idea of having physicians registering with some private information that they know and validating that back to other organizations and then having them to be able to, to sponsor users and delegate that, um, you know, that was a fairly complex set of requirements. We decided, you know what, we don't want to build all that complexity old school in the, the ASP.NET forms approach. We want to do it in the modern design philosophy because we knew we wanted to go here. This was a good chance to, to push that and get that going. <clears throat> So we're very open and transparent with the client. We let them know, you know, we're, we're not there yet, but our plan is to build this new structure, this new architecture for Extranet User Manager, and your project in parallel at the same time. So we started working on that, uh, very much a collaborative effort between us and Ontario MD. They had a number of developers on their team as well. Not so much from the Extranet User Manager implementation. We owned that part of it, but they were building their own apps for things like health card validation so that when a, a patient goes into a doctor's office in Ontario and they want to validate their health card, that's one of the apps that Ontario MD provides. And that was a legacy app built in Java, hosted on Linux, uh, but they wanted to modernize the authentication for that and provide single sign-on. So we worked on getting WS Federation going. At this point, we hadn't made the decision yet to move to OpenID Connect. Getting that single sign-on to happen, uh, they, they tried using Shibboleth as an intermediate between their applications and our external user manager. It was getting complex. It just wasn't hanging together and working well. So we said, you know what? Let's do a proof of concept. Let's try out OpenID Connect. Let's try out a new version of Identity Server 4 that's just come out, um, and, and let's see how that works. And reality was it was actually fairly straightforward to get that running with their apps and with our custom website that we were building for them. So we made the decision collectively as a team to, to switch midstream and go to OpenID Connect. So even though it wasn't planned to, to be part of this project, partway through we said let's pull that in as part of it and, and go out for that. So we actually launched that site in May 2017 on a preliminary version of Extranet Manager uh, version 4. It had the OpenID Connect support. It had the full REST API in there, uh, but it didn't have things like the, the full configuration capabilities. So some of the things we needed to configure in the underlying database, it was okay for a single implementation, not appropriate for a, a full product. So we spent the balance of the summer up until now refining that implementation. To be honest, we're not 100% of the way there. We've still got a few things left to do, uh, but we felt this was a good time to, to do the reveal and start to talk about what V4 looks like. So what I think is the best way to do it is, is to take you through a number of different features that are impacted by the version 4 release. So I'm not going to take you through all the, the Extranet User Manager features, some of them like multi-factor authentication and Easy Realm, Home Realm Discovery. I mean, those are there. They're great features of the product. They don't really change from V3 to V4. I'm going to use two different scenarios uh, to walk you through from a demo point of view. One is our, our demo implementation that we've done. So that's a, an on-premise hosted version we have here. 
under umdemo.com. And then we also have the www.ontariomd.ca site. We're going to refer to that just to show you some of the branding and customizations that we did as part of that project as well. So for those of you already familiar with Extranet User Manager, you're, you're probably familiar with landing and landing admin. And those are the, the two main applications in EUM. One is intended for the external users, and that's what we're showing here. It has the end user components on it. So the ability to register, to set my password, manage my profile, change your password, reset forgotten password, those are all part of the end user components. And this is a look at the registration page. I'll take you through a, a walkthrough of the full thing. And then we have the administration components. Uh, when we say admin though, we don't mean IT administrator. Yes, they use it to, to set up it and configure the system, but it's also used by business owners to, uh, to allow the delegation of adding, editing, importing users and groups into the system. You know, one of the, the big reasons behind Extranet User Manager is to take the day-to-day the -day decision of inviting and managing external users out of the hands of IT. IT doesn't want to own that. They don't have the business knowledge to make the right decisions as to who to invite and who not to. So we want to provide the tools to make it easy for the business owners or maybe even the, the external organizations themselves to manage those users. And that's a big part of what Extranet User Manager is all about. So this component provides that delegation model. It also provides the administrative components. So let's jump over to a browser here and take you through a bit of a tour on that side here. So I've um, signed in. Actually, let me sign out and take you right through the, the whole process from the beginning. So I've logged out. If I come back to the, the start, first thing we're going to see is the login form. It looks fairly similar to what we had before. Um, we've got the, the idea of username and password. Typically, we use an email address as the username. We can brand that and, and actually put email address in through that. Um, we're working on adding in external login support as well, so I can log in with Windows credentials, with ADFS, potentially even things like Google+, Facebook, LinkedIn. Um, not there yet, but that's absolutely something that we're working on through here. If I don't remember my credentials, I have the ability to hit a uh, forgotten password link here. I can enter in my email address. It will then email me a, a one-time use time expiring token to reset my password, and away I go from there. Now I've got my credentials here. I'm just going to go ahead and do the login. Whoops. And whoops, that's not the right one. Let's go to landing. Like I said, first demo through. There we go. So there's not a whole lot in here. I have the ability to come into my profile um, so I can bring up my uh, you know, name, address, phone number type of information as part of that, edit that as appropriate, and you can decide what goes on to that profile page. That's just taking a minute to get up and running. There we go. Uh, so I can see my first and last name, my email, um, number of different optional fields through there. What we're going to do a little later in the process is actually customize this form and show you how easy it is to, to change the look and feel of that form. I can also come in and change my password, um, enter my old password, my new password. We've got some neat stuff here where it's got a, a checklist that as I'm typing in my password, you know, because we've got some complexity rules on there, it's actually lighting up for me and telling me, hey, what have I passed from a password checklist point of view? I have to enter my password again to get the last one through there, and away we go from there. Now, these pages here, um, we're actually running inside of the Extranet User Manager application right now. And it's a, an ASP.NET application. It's got a master page that you can apply your own branding. So you don't have to have the Extranet User Manager branding as part of that. Or you can actually embed that right into your own site itself. So if we flip over to the Ontario MD site, um, we've got the ability here. We're on their public facing website. I'm not signed in. If I click on the register link, it'll bring me over to the registration page. You'll notice we're still in the Ontario MD .ca site. We haven't left and gone to EUM. What we've done is we've actually embedded um, those applets right into the Ontario MD site. So it's just some HTML you add onto the page, some JavaScript to support that. And again, we'll go a little deeper into that. Likewise, if I go down to say the uh, forgot password, Again, that's been embedded in. There's a number of other pages in there, um, more so once you sign into the site, uh, that you're able to, to interact with that. But just to give you a quick sense, you know, it's quite straightforward to then make that an embedded part of your application. All right. 
So I've actually jumped ahead into uh, the branding experience already here. I mean, we've we've talked about the fact that we can brand the the entire user experience, uh, not just the the pages themselves, but even in the emails. What we should probably do is flip back a bit onto our our walkthrough. We did a walkthrough on the end user side of it, but I skipped ahead and forgot about going into the landing and min uh, components to it. So this is the new landing admin interface, um, completely different look than, than the previous version of Extranet User Manager, you know, mobile friendly, works very well on smartphones, tablets, desktops. And right now I'm logged in as a configuration editor. So I have ability to, to not only manage users and groups, but actually configure the system itself as well. So I can come in here and say I want to you know, add a new user in. Uh, maybe I just want to do an invita invitation-only extranet. Um, they don't need a self-registration. I can simply enter all their information in, uh, put them in the appropriate groups, add them, and that'll send a welcome email out to them. I can do a search against users. I'll just do an open search. It's a demo system. We don't have many users in here. We've got a couple of test users through here. You know, we've got paging, which makes it very easy as we get into large amounts of users. It scales very well from that point of view. I can export my set of users to an Excel. So I can pull that up and open that. Sorry, that's just showing on my other page here. I don't think Excel is going to open right for me. Um, or I can even print the uh, the current list of users through there as well. So I, I have a number of different options of how I can interact with the results from that search. This is all fully customizable as well. If you want to change the search fields that appear here, uh, the columns that appear in the results, the, the columns that appear in the Excel, you know, that's all customizable through the application. So that's been a major push for this version is to make it very easy to do those sorts of customizations. I can do the same thing from a group's perspective to say, okay, I want to pull up a, a particular group here. I can see who the members of that group are, um, who the owners are, and so forth from there. And then lastly, we've got the configuration. So there's a number of different configurations I can manage through here. You know, there's the general system settings of, of how Extranet User Manager is set up, and the different URLs, how the security is configured, you know, who's who's allowed access into landing admin, who can import users, so on and so forth. Um, we can also come into uh, the client's side of it. So we're going to talk more about OpenID Connect and WS Federation. This is where you actually configure that. So we can see here, Extranet User Manager itself is actually an application that's registered with the identity provider. So the, the website itself is one type of um, client against the IDP. We've got all the information around the eomdemo.com site that we're coming into. If we come back there, we see I have a separate client registered with the JavaScript because it actually authenticates in a slightly different method. And then here we've got SharePoint coming in through WS Federation. Uh, so we can set all this up through the browser, through the configuration. Uh, likewise, I can configure my email settings. So, you know, what's my SMTP server, who are emails coming from and such through there. And then we've got a nice new interface for the email configuration. Uh, previously, you know, we've always supported uh, full HTML emails, but you had to know HTML in order to, to author those emails. Now we've embedded a nice a rich text editor as part of the email template. Where we can define the exact copy that we want to have coming in through there. Um, even things like putting template uh, tokens in through there, I can just start typing the token and say, well, I want to actually put the username at this point in the record. So it makes it very easy for me to, to understand what templates do I have available or what tokens do I have available in the template from there. I can send a test email out if I want to see how this looks and enable it from there. So we have a variety of different types of emails in here. We have the, the new account emails for regular users as well as Azure B2B because they're slightly different as to how those work. Uh, the forgotten password email. So if I um, don't remember my password, this is the email I'll get with a token to, to reset my password. And there's also the approval email. So for using self-registration, there's two emails that can be generated. One for the person who needs to approve. So this has a link to edit that record of the new person registering. And one for the person who's registered themselves, just letting them know that, hey, thanks for requesting an account. Once it's approved, you're going to get another email with instructions to set your password. So that's a quick walkthrough from an admin point of view. If we come back here, 
Um, let's jump into the, the single sign-on side. It's going to get a little bit technical here. Apologies if I, I go over the head on a few folks, uh, but I do want to cover off a, a bit here. Um, the idea behind single sign-on is users can sign in once, and as they go to different systems, they're automatically logged in. So that can be done either through WS Federation or OpenID Connect. Um, SharePoint on-premises only supports uh, WS Federation. Um, Office 365 is all done through Azure AD, so it supports both um, your custom applications, uh, third-party SaaS applications, things like that, may support one or either or both of those as well. But let's dive a little deeper into OpenID Connect, because it's new for Extranet User Manager. What, is it, what does it mean? Well, it's an authentication layer that's built on top of OAuth 2.0. If, if you've done work in the security and authentication space, you'd be familiar with OAuth. Um, OAuth has been, I don't know if bastardized is the right word, but um, hacked a bit to be used as an authentication protocol, which is not what it was ever intended to be. It was really an authorization protocol between different systems. So they came out with OpenID to connect to, to address that, to say, let's properly spec out how the authentication layer should work on top of OAuth. It was published in February 2014. All the major vendors were behind it. Um, and basically the idea is you've got an authorization server, which in our case is Extranet User Manager, that's performing the authentication. And then there's a number of different um, clients that may be requesting that authentication. It may be a web app like we saw with, with EUM itself. Um, that web app may have underlying web APIs. We have this classic security problem called the double hop, where I sign into a website, but now that website needs to access something else on my behalf. How do those credentials pass on to a second or a third system from there? OpenID Connect does a very good job of doing that. Um, JavaScript apps, again, from a security point of view, there's slightly different ways you want to secure those, um, not using session cookies, trying to avoid things like cross-site request forgery problems. Um, native mobile apps, so iOS, Android apps, you know, how should they authenticate? Or even server to server, maybe you've got batch processes that need to call into the APIs or workflows, things like that. Uh, those all need to be supported as well. I'm actually in the process of, of working out um, some diagrams and a white paper to explain all the different scenarios through here. Um, look for that coming out in the next little while. But I do have one that I've been working on just from a, a web application point of view, just to give you a taste of, of how that works and what that looks like. So basically what happens, if we start on the left, we've got a user who's opened their browser and they're going to a client site. So just like me going to the landing site in Extranet User Manager, you know, I put in the URL, I browse to that site, and that site says, I don't know who you are. You're not authenticated. Um, so it actually redirects back to the browser um, with a redirect code saying, you need to go over here to this identity provider. Once you get there, it's typically going to present a, a login form. Like in our case, we ask for an email address and a password. We might do a second factor authentication and do a SMS text message or a phone call as part of that. But whatever needs to happen, wherever that's been validated against, whether it's Active Directory or a SQL database, that comes back and it returns what's called an identity token. It's a, a JSON web token. So again, industry standard token provided not back to the web application, but back to the browser. And the browser then sends that in another request. It says, hey, it's me again. Now I've got a token to tell you who I am. Well, that, uh, that client web application doesn't necessarily know whose token that is and whether it should trust it or not. Um, so it actually goes out to the identity provider and downloads a key from there. This is a little different than WS Federation. WS Federation, that key got installed on the web application as an out-of-band process. In OpenID Connect, it's all part of the process itself. And typically, that's gets cached so that uh, subsequent um, tokens come through. You don't need to go back to the identity provider. It says, yep, it passes that. You've got the right key in there. That all looks good. I need to give you back your page and a cookie to, uh, to maintain your session from there. So that's kind of how um, OpenID Connect works. And like I mentioned, that's one of the five scenarios. Um, I'll, I'll provide another session or uh, a white paper that I'm publishing out on those others and how those work. All right, let's switch gear into self-registration. This is another big feature of Extranet User Manager, uh, the ability for you, um, external users to discover your portal to self-register on it and then go through some sort of approval process to grant them access into the site. So the reality is, you know, while we have an out-of-the-box registration form, let me just bring that up for us here. Oops. 
with standard fields on it, every client is different and, and they all want fields added, fields removed, and, and the reality is we've never deployed this form exactly as it is. We've always done some customizations to it. And, and that's where most of the, the customization work tends to happen on our projects is around the registration process. So that was a clear focus for UMV4 was to make that process easier to, to work. So I haven't done this live before yet, I've done a couple of dry runs. We're going to give it a whirl. I'm actually going to go through a, a customization process on this form. And the first thing I'm going to do is, you know what, nobody uses fax anymore. We probably shouldn't include that as part of the default. And in this particular portal, I don't really care about address information. So I'm going to remove all those fields off of the form. So what I'm going to do is show you a little under the hoods of the, the structure of EUM. So let me just open up Windows Explorer here. So I'm going to the actual IS server into the INET pub where we've got the EUM installation itself. And we can see we've got landing, which is the end user pieces, which includes the registration. We've got the landing admin we were looking at. We have the actual identity server. We've got the APIs that we'll look at a little bit later as well. But let's dive into landing. All right, so if I look down under register, I see there's a default.aspx. That's actually this page that I'm on right here. So what I'm going to do is fire up my Visual Studio here, and let me just bring that default.aspx page over, and we'll have a look at it. So there's actually very little to it. I mean, there's a, a page title to it, and there's an include of a register.html. So as I mentioned, it's all HTML and, and jQuery based. So let's have a look at that actual register.html. I've already got it open here. We can see, you know, it looks a little overwhelming if you're not a, a developer, but it's actually very straightforward HTML. It's built using Bootstrap, so we've got our, our one column and second column here because we've got our fields set up in two columns on the page. It is adaptive, so if I scale that down and say, okay, well, I'm on a, a smartphone, we can see it stacks up nicely from that point of view. Bootstrap gives us all that for free. Okay, but we want to take those fields out. So let's go through. And as part of that design, I actually want to take the email and the telephone and pull them over into that right column there. So let's have a look at my code here. Well, here's my fax number. So let's actually just start by getting rid of fax. I don't need to do anything else other than remove it from the HTML. That will take care of it. And here's my email and telephone fields. So I'm going to cut those. And then down here, we can see here's all of our address fields. So I'm just going to overwrite all of those and stick in my email and my phone fields. I'll go ahead and save that. So I'm saving it right onto the server itself. You'd never do this on your production site. You'd want to do it on your development server. And, and part of our product is when you buy the license and you keep your software assurance current, you're licensed for your dev and your test server. So you've always got these environments to be able to play around in. Go ahead and refresh my page. It's going to go back to the server, retrieve the new HTML for me. And boom, there's our new registration page. Looks much cleaner. Now we just got first and last name, email, telephone, public profile, and the e-newsletter. Let's say I actually wanted to put a new field in here, something that doesn't even exist in Extranet User Manager right now. Um, I'm going to use an example called webinar comments. So I want to add a, a comments field just like the public profile. So let me come back to my HTML, and I'm going to cheat. I'm actually going to use that public profile as a starting point for this. So if I grab that whole section there, and I just make a copy of it, and I'll call this one webinar comments. Now I have to update the name and the ID on the field, because that's what wires this together and makes it all work. Take the space out and set that there, and go ahead and save that. Now, you're going to ask, well, where does it put this? Well, it needs a place to save it into the database. And that place doesn't exist yet. So let's actually flip over to our SQL Server. Give me a sec here. We'll get our database open. Forgot to stage this out ahead of time. Uh, doo -doo 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 -doo. There we go. OK, let me pull this over. So I've gone on to our development SQL Server, and I've opened up the Extranet User Manager database. And here's all the tables that are under the hood in Extranet User Manager. There's a couple of special ones that I want to call out here. The one that we're going to work on is called User Extra. There's a table called User that stores all the core EUM user fields in there. We don't want our clients to be changing and 
messing with that one because that one is core to the functionality of the system. But we know that people want to add their own fields. So we have a table called user extra. Go crazy, add in all your columns that you want in there and, and we can wire that together. We have the same thing with role extra. So if you want to extend groups, uh, this is something new as well. Um, you can manage that through there. And even the relationship between users and groups, you can put additional columns or properties onto that as well. So let's open this one up here. I'll do a design on it. And we actually put the uh, the public profile in the e-newsletter in there as samples, just so people see an example of, of how this works and what this looks like. So we've got our webinar comments. We'll make that a text field. We'll leave it nullable. And I'll go ahead and save this. So I'm actually updating the data model of Xtrant User Manager. This doesn't break things from a, an upgrade point of view. Um, we've got a, a pretty slick database upgrade process where it tracks the, the database versions and, and will update the data model. And it knows to leave these extra tables alone because those have the client customizations in them. Okay, so I've got the new uh, field in my database. I've updated my front end code. Let's come back to our page. Go ahead and refresh that. Boom, there's our webinar comments field. Okay, so let's actually go through our registration. So let's put in, I think three was the last one I used, so I'll use four this time. Let's actually put some comments in here. Okay, I hit register. And that's going to call out to the REST API and do that registration. Successful. Woohoo. Okay, so let's go back to our database for a second. I've actually got a script saved here. So it's just going to select that webinar comments field from that user extra table. I'll go ahead and run that. And we can see, you know, we just added the last record in there, which was the pcarson for the envisionit365.com. And there's my comments for webinar. So just by modifying some HTML, adding a, a column to a database table, I've now wired in a new field through Extranet User Manager. That was really easy. You know, it, it's certainly much simpler than what it was in previous versions of EUM. And what's happening underneath the hood there, um, this registration HTML, when it's getting submitted, it's using this JavaScript file to submit it. We can actually have a look at that JavaScript file. It's actually really simple too. So it's it's creating a, a post data value here and it's saying, okay, go through and serialize all the form fields that are not tagged as extra fields on the EUM page. So it's basically understanding the, um, the, the HTML structure here of all these fields and scraping all the values off of there and building up all that data. And then go find me all the, the, the ones that are tagged with user and serialize them into a single field called user extra. That's how we pass that back. We don't have explicit API fields for those custom attributes. They all get put into one block of JSON. I make the display name, the first name, and the last name, and then go ahead and post this to the user's REST API endpoint. We can actually look at that API endpoint. So if I come back to my browser here, let me just grab the, uh, actually, I think I've got it saved in my OneNote. There we go. We use an open source tool called Swagger uh, to document our API. So it makes it very easy for developers to understand what are all the API endpoints. And we can see here um, all the different um, classes down in the, the users class here. Uh, we can see there's our post of users. That's the one that we're calling right now to do the registration. You know, I could even come through here, um, put in some sample values, and try out the API right through this interface. So, you know, from a unit testing point of view or developer point of view, it makes it very easy to experiment with this. And we can see all the other methods. I can retrieve users. So there's a whole um, OAuth filtering where I can filter and sort what results I want to, to come back from that. We've got the ability to get an individual user by their key or to update an individual user, uh, trigger off the forgotten password, set a password, load the current user. You know, and likewise in, in all the others through here, you know, roles or groups. So I can get, create and, and update groups through here in a similar kind of fashion as well. So this makes it very easy if you're doing your own customizations. This is all very self-explanatory as to how that's all wired together. All right, so 
Actually, this is probably a good point. Why don't I continue on the self-registration side of things? So let's come back to my inbox for a second. And I've got an email here. Uh, remember, we had the, the welcome email. We were able to customize through that rich text editor. Here's all the copy that's coming through as part of that. And there's a link here for me to set my password. I've got until uh, tomorrow at this time, roughly. We give it a 24-hour expiry. But again, you can configure that as part of the email templates. So I click on that link. I get to my page here uh, where I can set my password. Let's go ahead. We've got our rules triggering off live there. Boom, boom, boom. We've got them all except the match. So let's just put the same password in. Boom, we're green, we're good. We can set our password. There we go. So then actually let me take this uh, link here, open an incognito window because I'm not logged in. We'll get the login there. I can go in as my pcarson4 user that we just created. Use that password that I just set and go ahead and log in. Oops, I have to actually spell my email address properly. Let's try that again. And then we have the ability to, to put up a legal disclaimer. You can put whatever copy you want in there. It's kind of interesting. Google wants to translate Laura Mipsum. I'm curious almost to see what that would do. I go ahead and agree on the terms and conditions. Everything that happens in Extranet User Manager is audited. So accepting the disclaimer, successful and successful logins, changed to profiles, um, and administrative changes are all getting logged in the underlying database. So go ahead and enter the site. And there we go. I can come into my profile. Oops. And there's all my profile information. Now remember, I only updated the register form. I'd need to come in and update this one as well to put my custom fields on there um, to make that match from that point of view. That's just another HTML file. We allow you to keep it differently if you want to have different rules. Like right now, we're allowing editing of the email address. You might want to turn that off and say, you know what, we don't want our end users to change their email address that they registered with. And likewise, when we're back in the admin console, let's see here. I'm going to do a search of user. <clears throat> Let's bring up that Peter Carson 4 record that we just created. Again, this is another HTML um, that has additional administrator fields on it, but you'd want to uh, pair this one back and have that match as well. So really when you're customizing fields, there's actually three spots. There's the register, there's the my profile, and there's the edit user page, all of which you want to keep those in sync and, and have a similar set of fields. Not necessarily 100% exactly the same, uh, but certainly uh, matching from there. All right. Now, if we want to do um, more sophisticated customizations, maybe there's a back-end system that we want to integrate into. Let's actually flip back to the Ontario MD example. If we look at their registration, theirs is actually a multi-step registration. You have to come through this first step. We need to provide your OMA number, which is basically your physician's license number and your date of birth. Um, that'll call out to an OMA service. Then there's a second validation that happens within the next step of the, the uh, registration to make sure that you are actually a physician in the province of Ontario. Obviously, those endpoints are not supported by out-of-the-box Extranet User Manager. So what we did in the Ontario MD case is we actually created a, an Ontario MD specific API. And the registration form calls that API. It securely implements those additional business rules, and then it calls the EUM API from there. And we can lock the EUM API down so that you can't bypass that and call it directly, that you have to go through that OMA API as a front end to do that. So we can do fairly deep integrations into backend systems. We could change the uh, the approval workflows. You know, do we want auto approvals in certain scenarios and things like that? You know, those sorts of business rules you don't want to put in the JavaScript on the front end. People can bypass. They can go into developer toolbar and and do their own thing there. You want to make sure that those are securely implemented on the backend API. So having that second API or that custom API in front um, allows you to do that. If you don't need a custom API in front of all the EUM functionality, you can cherry pick and say, well, these are the endpoints that I want to add my own business rules on. I'm only going to put an API in front of that. We can certainly help you with those architectural decisions as you're planning out your extra. As I mentioned before, uh, it's fully adaptive. So whether we're in the, uh, the end user pages, you know, let's come back to the registration page here. 
just reload that back up. So we've got our customized reg registration page. We didn't do anything special about making it mobile friendly, but we can see it nicely stacks up with the webinar comments above the public profile right where it's supposed to be through there. And likewise, if we come into uh, the admin page, you know, we're, we're in the administrative side of it here. Uh, previously, we hadn't done a mobile friendly experience on the admin pages. Now all the admin interface is fully mobile friendly as well. So if you get a mobile um, alert saying, hey, somebody just registered on your site, you could open it, edit that user, approve them, be done all on your smartphone all very easily. So what have we done uh, different from a licensing point of view? The good news is nothing. We've actually kept the licensing exactly the same. Uh, we have a very simple model. It doesn't depend on the number of external users, doesn't depend on the size of the farm that you're deploying this into. Uh, really the only two variations are standard and enterprise. And the difference between the two is how many systems are you authenticating to. Let's say you wanted to use our product for an extranet just for SharePoint. That SharePoint farm can be as big as you want, can have multiple web front end servers, lots of external users. That would be a standard edition. Doesn't matter how many site collections or web applications you have, it's still standard edition. If you decide, well, we want to do single sign on, we've got a, a bunch of different applications. Take the Ontario MD example, uh, for instance. You know, there's the actual Ontario MD website itself, but I mentioned the other Java apps like the Health Card Validator, those are separate applications. So that's what takes you into the enterprise edition. That can either be purchased as a perpetual license for on-premises, you install it on your own servers, and then there's a 20% annual software assurance, or we can actually host that for you. That's what we did for Ontario MD. Uh, we actually host that in our own multi-tenant environment. Uh, we provide all the software assurance and, and support and everything as part of that. All the full pricing details are up on our website. We're very uh, public and full disclosure from that point of view. So what's the upgrade path? If you're an existing extra user manager client, either on V2 or V3, um, what's the path going to be like moving to UMV4? Well, the first is from a licensing point of view. So you need to be current on your software assurance. As long as you've kept current on that, uh, there's no additional upgrade fee. Uh, you're eligible to upgrade to V4. It can be either a hosted or on-premises implementation. You may decide to, to change. Maybe you don't want to host your own anymore and move to an on-premises. We can certainly negotiate what that hosting fee would be like um, and, and how that would work. Now, your existing UM database, I mentioned previously we had a, a fairly intelligent uh, database upgrade process, so it's very easy to, to do that upgrade. All your existing users and groups are retained through that. They don't need to set new passwords. Nothing changes from that point of view. You know, the, the data model gets updated to support the new features and such, but the core tables themselves are still there with all their data. Now, V3 to V4 is actually a pretty simple replacement. You know, we don't need to change any permissions in SharePoint. We're still a WS Federation provider. In fact, if you use the same name for the new implementation <coughs> as a provider name, all your permissions just flow right through. SharePoint's none the wiser. It's happily uh, connecting to the V4 from there. V2 is a little different because it was uh, deeply ingrained into the, the SharePoint installation as a forms-based authentication. So our recommendation there is that you uninstall EUM at that point, so basically remove it from SharePoint. That leaves the database there, so you still got the database in place, and then do a new installation of EUM v4 against that existing database. It'll stu still do the database upgrade, but at the end of that, you do have a little more work involved in, in SharePoint because those users and group permissions that you've assigned are going to look a little bit different in V4. Um, it's pretty straightforward. We've got existing PowerShell scripts <coughs> that we use the same way when going from V2 to V3 that you can run against your PowerShell or against your SharePoint site collections. Now, any customizations, though, they're going to need um, probably a full redevelopment or significant rework, depending on how they're architected. You know, if you'd built them on top of previous versions of the APIs, you're probably going to be able to, to fairly easily move them to the new APIs, but most people's customizations were baked into the, uh, the web forms applications themselves. Those need to be reworked as, as net new um, HTML and, and REST API interfaces. And you may need a, a custom API to implement some of the business rules that you've got in as part of that. So we can certainly work with you to understand what those customizations are. We may have built them for you already, uh, so we've already got that understanding to, to see what's going to be involved in moving that across. Once you've done that move, though, you know future upgrades are going to be much easier because we have decoupled that. That was a big goal of, of UMB4.
All right, so I think that's about it. Um, I've got the demo links in here that are primarily there for the slides. You can actually go to the sites and have a look around. Uh, this provides a little bit more background on the Ontario MD case study. We do have full case studies up on our website on this. And as I mentioned, we have a previous webinar on it as well. Uh, so I won't go too much in detail on, on what's in here. And like I mentioned, we've got links in here to the case studies themselves. If you want to dive deeper into that customer scenario, I encourage you to do that. Uh, in terms of upcoming events, uh, Mark Campbell, one of our staff, and myself are actually going to be going down to Microsoft Ignite uh, September 25th to 29th. We won't have a booth there, but we're going to be attending. Uh, so if you'd like to meet up in person, by all means, reach out, and we can coordinate some time from that point of view. Um, we will have a booth at Point Fest if you're in the Chicago area, December 7th, 8th, and uh, more events planning. We're just uh, working out our conference schedule for 2018 and, and putting some exciting plans together on that side. So I haven't been watching questions that we've been going through. Not sure if there's ones that uh, that I need to answer through there. Looks like we're good on that side. Uh, so there we go. We'll give you 10 minutes of your day back. Uh, appreciate everybody joining me today and uh, hope to, uh, to have some interesting conversations on moving to UMV4. Thanks very much, everybody. Have a great day.